Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Carlisa. Uh, this is Lori Grant, Assistant Director, Agency Oversight Division, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar so that we can discuss the new MD715 2.0 part forms. I assume many of you have already started using the forms, and we want to uh, be available to provide feedback on the forms and also um, respond to any questions that you have or technical issues. As Tim said, we'll, we would um, we hope to use the chat function because it's easier for us to respond to the questions that way. Uh, and then if we need follow-up, that's when we'll use the audio. However, if you're not able to use the chat function, certainly you can use the audio. The plan is that we'll answer questions after we discuss each part form. Uh, before we get started, I just want to point out on the main page, this is the MD715 uh, homepage that you'll see in FedSEP. And under the second heading that I'm circling here, you'll see the MD715 part data reporting period extension request. And this, this form uh, is where agencies will need to request an extension. We're not accepting extensions via email any longer. Uh, so please enter the, the extension request here and we should respond within 24 hours. Uh, you'll see uh, the update. It will tell you whether your request has been approved or denied on this home page. So with that, uh, I'll ask Anupa Iyer to um, start talking about the part forms. Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. Um, so before we get started with the forms, for those of you who um, have, are not able to join the Skype meeting, I just want to give you a layout of how we, were, how we are planning to run the rest of this meeting. What we are doing is we've created a sample MD715 for uh, an agency. Um, and just a quick reminder, please, everyone, if you could mute your phones um, so that we don't get feedback and everyone can hear what we're uh, discussing, that'd be great. Uh, hello? Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay, um, so what we decided to do is to create an MD715 report um, and walk folks through the process because we know that this year um, EOC rolled out the new part forms, part forms 2.0, using the new FedSAP platform. So everything in here is now new, and to make things a little better, we thought it would be helpful to walk folks through what the FedSet portal looks like, what you need to do to provide, you know, input your data and certify your report. So with that, um, I would ask if, if any of you are actually on FedSet to please log off of FedSet because that will slow down um, my ability to access this report in the presentation. So when you go in as an agency, what you will see is your, you know, here's your drop down menu for MD715. So we're gonna start off with part A, which is your department or identifying agency. Since this is a new report, you will have to input all of this data. And we have created the EOP Trade Representative Agency. Um, the agency code is populated. And then for the FIPS code, uh, you can, in the instructions for Section 3, we do have a link, if you don't know what your code is, that will take you to the OPM site for your code. 
once you enter your data here, you have to hit save. So now part A is complete. The next part is part B. What's important with part B is that you do have to end the end enter the total number of permanent and full-time and part-time employees, you have to do that as your second step because it's based off of your Part B that your Part E, which is the executive summary, will generate which sections are required. So I would highly recommend entering your data on Part B right away. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, please post them in the, the chat form or um, speak up in the next three or four seconds before we move on to Part C. Do we have any questions in chat? Not at this time. Nope. nope. Great. Hello, I'm sorry. Hi, this is Laura yeah, Heigl. Um, I just got off of mute. I'm, I apologize for the bit of the delay. But can, are you able to provide over the uh, presentation via email? I don't have access to the link at yes. the moment to, to see. Oh, yes, ma'am. What we'll be doing is we'll be sending out, we don't have a slide deck that's currently available okay. for today's presentation. However, uh, the meeting is currently being recorded and we'll make it available to all registrants. And if you um, did not register via SurveyMonkey, you can request it uh, via email at federaltrainingandoutreach at eeoc.gov. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and just, to, just to make sure, Lisa, is there anything I need to do to record the screen? No, the meeting is currently being recorded. Great. I had one additional question regarding that um, employee data. Now, on mine, I took it as it was a permanent workforce, which doesn't include our temporary employees. But when my Part B populated based off the data, it pulled my permanent plus my temporary employees. Now, should I be overriding that, or is it supposed to go from your permanent and your temporary employees? Lori? I'm trying to understand the question. So the, the first number is the permanent full-time and part-time employees. Uh, and then the second one is the temporary employees. And what it will do is add the two numbers together to equal your total workforce. Could you clarify if there's something that I've missed? I'm sorry, that star six for the muting takes out about seven seconds of a conversation. Um, so, no, I was just, I was believing that the temporary workforce and the permanent workforce were two separate things, but from what I understand, from what I was able to capture, um, they are not. Those two numbers are, by the EEOC, are considered your full-time force, your permanent force. No, that we have two different fields for permanent and temporary. Right, and that's what has been filled out on the rest of my form, but it that Part B data is taking the total of both. That's the total workforce. So you have the first, and are you able to access, you're not on the screen, correct? Not on your screen, no, unfortunately. Okay, so on the directions, the first line says, enter total number of permanent full-time and part-time employees. Right. The next is enter total number of temporary. Okay. If we'll wait just a moment. Okay, Anupa, you're back online. It looks like you. Hello. Okay. Go ahead, Anupa. Sorry, okay. you were you were muted. Hello. Hello. It looks like you left the meeting for a moment. Hello. Can you hear me? I yes. got you to stop the call. 
Yes, we can hear you. Um, but okay. We can, but we need for you to start sharing your screen again. It's, uh, I don't believe it's being seen uh, by the participants. Okay, is that now working? Oh, it's loading it now, it looks like. I believe like. it's loading, Anupa. Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go. Uh, and I am now, now on it. through the Skype, through my desktop. I'm not sure why I got kicked off the phone. Oh, okay. Okay. Just, Anupa, before you begin, just uh, a note to, uh, because of the background noise of those who don't mute their phones, that we may have to mute everyone, and then that mutes, including the speaker, until they're back on. So. Please, uh, if you could mute yourself, if you're not actually asking a question, that would be helpful. Go ahead, Anupa. Great. Um, were we able to answer the question about Part B? I think you need to repeat it. Were we able to answer the question about Part B? Which was, how do you get your total workforce? Um, you were you were answering that question, correct? Right. Okay. Sorry. So what I was trying to say was that you your first box is to enter the total number of permanent, full time, and part time employees. The second box is enter your total number of temporary employees. Then your total workforce is both your permanent full-time and part-time employees and the number of temporary employees. That's the total workforce. Correct. Never mind. Okay. So moving on, um, you would hit save. And then there is information um, under the directions for intelligence agencies which it says for intelligence agencies, please enter the value of one in the field. Um, so moving on, we have part C, which is your agency officials and um, responsible officials. So there are um, sort of two different categories here. Um, the first asks, for you to identify the individuals and groups that will be responsible for the oversight of the EEO programs. It also notes that the agency head and EEO director are required for certification. So when you are going to add your agency head or agency head designee, you would click the add button. Um, and we've already populated it down here and this is what it will show up, but you would go in and there any um has a star means it's required so here you would enter either your head of agency or head of agency designee their name and their title in that case i've already done it so lori grant as you can see is the head of agency Next is to add an official. So when you're adding an official, the required element is your principal EEO director. And then the list of questions asks for your name, for the, their name, title, pay plan, grade, phone number, and email. All of those are required elements. In terms of your EEO program staff, there is a number of folks that you can enter, um, select to give us a broad picture of your overall agency program. And that includes your affirmative employment manager, complaint processing manager, DNI officer, your SEPAMs for Hispanic program, women's programs and disability programs, special placement coordinator, reasonable accommodation program manager, and a harassment program manager, ADR program manager, compliance manager, MD715 preparer, and other EEO staff. And I would highly, you know, advise the agency to, to list out some of those core functions to make sure that those, the information about those people, those folks are captured. Um, and once, so you would hit a name, uh, 
I'm going to go with, I've already entered two, but I'm going to put in uh, the reasonable accommodation manager because we've uh, dis discussed them in the rest of the report. Um, James S. And actual title is disability program manager. Pay plan would be GS. Um, grade of 14. Phone number and then email james at eop.gov. I would hit save and then James now populates under my lit contact list. You can always, the little, there's a trash box on your right hand side which allows you to delete a name um, and then you can also edit using the pencil. I'm going to stop now and pause for questions if anyone has questions. Okay, so, so and, oh, and, and go ahead, Lori. Oh, that, that was Lisa. I just, um, there was a question from Tamara Jackson. I didn't know if it was noticed in the uh, chat room. And she was asking um, how students were counted. How do you want students counted? Example, pathways. Um, this is Anupa. So, depend, if they are hired, it depends on if they are a Pathways intern, because if they are, then there would be a hiring code for them, correct? So when you're um, going through the SF50, for example, if they're hired as a Pathways student intern, then the code would designate them as a um, either a temporary going through whatever the, the definition of temporary is in OPM regulations or they would be identified as full-time uh, not to exceed. I'm happy to um, provide more details if it but I think it's it's dependent on if it's pathways and it's a two-year pathways program or if you're looking at a student summer intern. Anupa, there's another question about uh, asking whether, I guess about EEO officials, they want to know whether it's current or for the reporting period. Lori? That's a very good question. Uh, I would say that it would be the current person because that's the person who's certifying the MD-715 report. Okay. Uh, I noticed someone uh, in the comments stated that you cannot enter extensions on the telephone number. Uh, that's something that we will uh, notify our uh, Office of Information Technology to see if they can add a column, if not now, but possibly in the future. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. And there's another question in here. Just uh, will you be getting to talk about part one today? Is that part of the presentation today? Is that part I? Excuse me, part I. Uh, yes. Are there any other questions on parts A through C? There, there appears to be a question on whether other um, titles can be ish, uh, entered. Someone is asking uh, other EEO officials, not EEO director. Well, right. And so when you are going to the add official, the first um, box is agency leadership slash EEO program staff. And there is a drop down menu that has a list of staff such as your affirmative employment manager, complaint processing manager, and at the very bottom of the drop down list is other EEO staff. So if they're not listed in if that category is accepted, you will want to select 
other EEO staff name, title, pay plan, grade, phone number, and email. So you have that option. Okay, I think that does it. That's it for questions now. No, I'm sorry. There's one, one more is asking about what is the compliance manager intended to capture on the form? Some agencies have a compliance officer designated, particularly the larger uh, cabinet agencies have teams that are responsible for compliance, and, that, and that's who we were intending to capture. I think that's all the questions for now. Great. So now we're going to get to part D, which is both your list of subordinate components and supplemental documentation. This is one of the areas that have changed um, from the previous versions of MD 715. So in the first section of part D1, um, it asks, to identify the subordinate components within the agencies, which is bureaus, regions, et cetera. And then if the agency does not have any subordinate components, you would check the box. So on my screen, I check the box. If you want to show you what it looks like, I am going to uncheck the box. And there is an option to add a new subordinate component. When I open that, you have a list of questions. So first is name, so that would be the component or bureau name, the city, state, country, and then the agency code for that subordinate component. You would hit save, and then that component would populate under the list of subordinate components covered in the report. I'm going to go back to clicking no subordinate component. And I'm not sure what just happened. Okay, so now there are no subordinate components for this agency and it'll show no records found. The second part of this screen is part D, the D2, which is your mandatory and optional documents for this report. So in, MD, in the 2.0 version of MD 715, to capture the new requirements under section 501, as well as requirements for agencies to have anti-harassment policies and procedures, we have updated the list of mandatory documents. So the required documents are now include your agency's strategic plan, your alternative dispute resolution procedures, anti-harassment policy and procedures, your EEO policy statement, your org chart, your personal assistance service procedures, and your reasonable accommodation procedures. All of those documents must be submitted in order for the agency to certify the report. Agencies also have the option to submit other supporting documents, such as your DVAP report, a diversity statement, your EEO strategic plan, FIORP, human capital plan, results from your uh, FEVS survey, and other documents. So when you are looking through your report, through, through Part D2, there is a list of documents. And on one side, it'll say if the document's mandatory, and on the next column will ask, is this document submitted? So here we have, I've, for this agency, I have submitted the strategic plan, the reasonable accommodation procedures, org chart, PAS procedures, EEO policy procedure statement, and the anti-harassment policy, but I've not submitted the ADR procedures. Um, so what I'd like to do is walk folks through how to upload a document. 
The one thing I would like to note is for some agencies that have the reasonable accommodation procedures and in the personal assistance service procedures, if they are also part of your reasonable accommodation procedures, you do have to submit them twice and need to change the name of the document in order for it to upload. Anupa, I hate to interrupt, but I think there's some questions here. If you get too far down the road, it will be hard to answer or harder to answer. So one question is, if an agency does not have one or more of the mandatory documents to attach, would that prevent the agency from getting all the necessary check marks to certify the report? And so what do we do if we don't have all the necessary documents? I'll, I'll take this one, Tim. It's Lori. And what I would suggest is that the agency uh, type in a Word document and convert it to PDF, uh, something that explains wh uh, why the document is not available. And you can post that document in its place as a placeholder until it is available. The other thing I would note for some agencies, if you are, and I have seen this, um, is if the agency is in the drafting process, um, so for your reasonable accommodation or PAS procedures, if you're in the drafting process, they will upload a document that says draft. And also there's another question related to those PAS procedures, and that says what should we do if, they're the, if the PAS procedures are the reasonable accommodation procedures? So I, it depends on if the agency has a statement that says the procedures for processing and providing PAS are the same as those for reasonable accommodations. So if that's the case, and that is in your reasonable accommodation procedures, you would want to save your reasonable accommodation procedures and rename it as PAS procedures and upload it. If the agency has not included PAS in their reasonable accommodation procedures, and they have no um, information on their website about how the agency will provide PAS, then you should do what Lori said, which is upload a Word doc, a PDF that explains why there are no, why there are no um, procedures or why the reasonable accommodation procedures do not address PAS. Okay, one final one while, we were, while we're answering questions here, and that it was, uh, they're asking about is this the current org, org chart or is it as of September 30, 2018? In this case, I would say that it would be the one for the reporting period because all of the documents that are being uploaded should have existed during that reporting period. Also, I guess people are in response to your response to the question, if the reasonable accommodation procedures and PAS are under review by EEOC, should they also be marked draft? Do we add a note stating procedures are at EEOC for review? Uh, that Did would you? actually be, I would encourage that um, because uh, we are um, we are looking at FedSEP to see if people are also just submitting new procedures. So. Yes, please mark draft because that is something that I I am uh, responsible for reviewing. So it is a good idea to just mark it as draft and under review. And for some agencies, if your RA and PAS procedures have been approved, if you do note that, that's helpful for us. Um, yeah, okay. oh, go ahead. No, in a more general question here, if the agency has subcomponents, will the subcomponents have access to the portal or will the information be rolled up into one report? The subcomponents do not have access to uh, any other report. I don't, I do not believe that, well, let me say that I believe that is the case. Uh, the department has access to the subcomponents. Okay, for now, I think that's it for now. Great. So I'm going to hit upload.
to upload the ADR procedures. So go to select file type, ADR procedures, I'm putting fiscal year 2018, and then it goes select file, um, and I am, go, I, there's my ADR procedures. I am now uploading. And it's been uploaded. I will say also note that in terms of the documents you can upload, they can be a Word doc, a PDF, and a JPEG. So here we've got all of the documents uploaded, and those are the required documents. I will say that if um, for some agencies, if you have um, altered, if you've uh, created other forms of the workforce tables, for example, you can upload them as other, um, as well as if you have any other documents that you think are important to highlight what the agency has done in terms of um, in terms of the overall MD715 reporting requirements, you can do that through other. So now I'm going to move on to part E, which is the executive summary. So based on the agency size, which is a thousand full-time and part-time employees, and that is actually what, uh, in terms of what part E, uh, which sections of the executive summary you would, are required to complete, the directions make it clear that all agencies must complete part E1, which is your overall summary. Agencies with 199 fewer employees in full-time and part-time appointments are required to complete E2 to E5. Agencies with 200 or more employees full-time and part-time appointments have the options to complete E2 to E5. So for large agencies, the, the real goal is to summarize your overall plan in part E1. And that's really your, the, it's the mission statement, it's your executive summary, it would be what you are presenting to your leadership. And that's because we want to make sure that for larger age agencies with a thousand or more employees, that part and or 200 or more, right? Depending on how much you want to fill out, but part E1 is the basic summary because really the rest of the plans, parts H and I and J, um, especially parts H and I, because smaller agencies do not are not required to fill those sections out but larger agencies are required to complete part H's and I's. So your executive summary should be limited and your real analysis should go into the part H and I. Is there anything you want to add, Lori? Yes, uh, please do not upload any tables, charts, pictures, into the spreadsheet. If the spreadsheet gives you that option to create it, then you can create it. Uh, but don't upload um, tables or charts or anything that are that comes from outside so you're copying and pasting into the, the material because the fear is that it will not uh, save in our database. Do we have questions? Uh, well, Anupa, but there's one that, that harkens back actually to, a little, to your previous uh, discussion on tables A and B, A before. It says, how should the agency convert non-GS to GS for for that for A slash A slash B four, especially if there is no conversion equivalence? They're saying that at their agency, there's pay bands that have some conversion, others don't. How should we convert those pay bands to GS equivalents? I think One of the, the, oh, go so, ahead, Lori. So the reason that we created alternate pay tables is to allow, well, to allow agencies to present the 
information, the, the demographic data that they have, without having to go through the conversion process. Um, so I, I, agencies are not required to convert uh, unless they want to, and I know some agencies have chosen to do so. Anupa, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, no, but I, I guess I, I would just say that regardless of the, if this is about the total workforce, that regardless of the pay band they're on, they are part of your, they would, if they are on a pay band and they are in a full-time or part-time appointment, then that's part of your total workforce. Are there other questions? Uh, someone is asking for clarity. Are you saying if I create, um, I guess I'm not sure, um, a table, I, I cannot copy it into the executive summary? No, that's correct. I, that's correct. What you can do is upload the table as a supporting document and in the executive summary reference that document. There's also a uh, table button in, right, the, yes. in, the, in the, so you could manually create a table, but please do not copy and paste into the, a table into the document, into the part E text box. And on my screen, I have the pop-up that shows when you, if you do choose to create your, a table in part E. You can choose the rows, widths, columns, etc. Another question here um, that got missed a little bit earlier: How are you defining small agencies for the purpose of parts H, I, and J? What is the number of employees? In section three, uh, almost at the beginning of the document, we have a chart that defines agencies by size. Uh, and what it states is that uh, agencies that are 199 or fewer permanent employees must enter parts A through G and part J, whereas agencies with 200 or more employees must enter all of the part forms. And then there's a, a question on, is there a character limit on sections of Part E? Um, I believe it's, uh, at, I think it's 1,000 or 10,000 characters or more for each section. But once again, depending on the agency, um, and this is also why part, uh, depending on the agency, if it's a large agency, part E1 should be brief. Um, and then you have the option to complete the other sections. Um, and that's because there is the rest of the report for the agency to complete. In terms of smaller agencies, part E2 would be your executive summary of elements A through F essential elements A through F. E3 would be a summary of your workforce analysis. And E4 is a summary of your accomplishments over the fiscal year. And E5 would be a summary of your planned activities. And it's broken out in this format because for um, sections that are other than disability, you would not have, you, you are not required to fill out a part H or a part I, um, so that the barrier analysis or analysis of your of deficiencies within the EEO program should be captured in your executive summary. For, uh, for uh, agencies with 200 or more employees, the part H, I should really be the place where you are describing the agency's plans to address uh, deficiencies and barriers in the EEO program. 
So sorry, Nupa, that some of these are hard questions that you go a little beyond, but there's a clarifying question here in terms of table B, B1 for schedule A, is EOC referring to schedule A appointments or schedule A disabilities? Uh, are you, I assume this is about the workforce tables? Is that? Yeah. that? In table B. Oh. In table B, okay. So I think it's table B7 because in the current tables that we're using for this year, that's the only reference that we make to Schedule A. And that involves the people who applied and who were selected. And that's the Schedule A hiring authority for people with disabilities, which is by CFR 213.3. 102 u not Schedule A, all the other hiring authorities. And just for folks to know on this call that for this year, we are using the same um, 14 workforce tables. So it's the old tables. Um, we will be moving to the new tables in the next fiscal year. Um, that said, for the B tables, the new B tables do have the updated SF-256 codes to capture that data. But the number of tables and the tables that need to be completed by agency size, that's the same as it was the previous year. And just a, a highly uh, technical issue here with part E. If you if they manually create a table, can they copy rows in the table or do they have to do it cell by cell? Um I think you would have to enter the data into the cell by cell. I don't I, I don't know, but that's a great question and we can check on it. Or you could try it out. <laughs> Um, okay, another general question. I thought if you had less than 500 employees, you did not need to complete the MD715. Has that now changed and the number is now 200 employees? No, what I think they're talking about is perhaps su uh, subcomponent reports. Uh, for parent agencies, They all agencies, regardless of size, must submit an MD715 report. If the agency has a subcomponent, for example, many of the cabinet agencies have subcomponents, then if they have a thousand or more employees, they also would be required to submit an MD715 report to EEOC. And any fewer employees, then they submit them to their headquarters. And if you're refer if this person is asking about Part J, um, the requirement for all agencies, regardless of size, to submit Part J, that was uh, that was required actually starting in FY for the FY17 report under uh, the updated rule for Section 501 of the Rehab Act, which requires agencies to submit an affirmative action program plan for people with disabilities. So your Part J is creates your affirmative action plan, and all agencies are required to submit that. Okay, and there are do some. Do we have any questions on the phone? I just uh, I'm not getting it. Are there questions on the phone that we know of? the The audience is not muted, so uh, so they can add, ask questions. There is a question. Um, another question about tables A, B, 4. The guide says that for agencies with alternative pay systems to include federal wage system, must select and complete the appropriate pay system tables. Where do you get these other pay system tables? For the federal wage system. If you have an alternative pay system to include federal wage systems, 
because you must select and complete the appropriate pay system. I'm wondering where you get those. Does that question make sense to you? If you look on the Excel template, which is in the guidance page of FedSEP, it has uh, tabs for each of the alternate pay systems, and you can see the, the grades uh, for each of those system, um, alternate pay plans. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure, I know, but you may have mentioned this before, but the question is, saying, are you using the 14 tables for fiscal year 19? Yes. Oh, no, for fiscal year 19? Uh, no, we are, um, we will be converting, hopefully, to the uh, modified, the updated tables. Just just to be clear, the 14 are for this year, not, ne not next year. Um, and if in prior years we uploaded one Word doc or PDF for Part E, are you saying now separate out the sections in Part E, cut and paste sections or part of Part E into applicable sections, or Part E1, E2, E3, et cetera? I don't understand the question. I guess that they're wondering if you now separate out the sections in Part E, um, and I'm not sure I understand the cut and paste sections, but they're, uh, they're asking how you deal with Part E to separate out the sections. I mean, I would say that, you know, there there's a reason why we have separated out Part E by section so that it is broken down by which part of the executive summary you're discussing. Now, once again, that is dependent on your agency size because we ha we noticed in previous years that and and across the board within uh, the in the old version of MD 715, the executive summary was broken down by sections. But what we noticed was a number a large number of agencies would put detailed information in their executive summary that would actually not translate into either your plans to address deficiencies or your plans to address barriers. So your part H and your part I. And really those are that's the place that we want to that agencies should be reporting on what they are doing. Because we have the questions in Part G. Where, that's where you should be identifying deficiencies in your EEO program, and you're required to report on what steps the agency is taking to address those deficiencies and who are the responsible officials. If you put everything in a summary, then the agency does not, it indicates the agency does not really have a plan. And there's a reason why MD 715 does have these various part forms. And when you, by creating plans to address the barriers, you have a comprehensive approach to ensuring your agency is a model EEO employer. And we sure. want to see what progress the agency is making on those plans. So speaking in that in that way about the larger look, where we have some more questions, but it's it's a uh, Five minutes to one, and this this we go till one fifteen. So I probably you have. We should a few probably move on. Yeah. Great. So with that, I am going to move to um, part G, which is your self assessment checklist. Um, as you, many of you know, the part G, the two point part G, has a number of new questions um, and it uh, a number of new sections that are looking at. It's more comprehensive in terms of your agency's EEO program. So there are new questions on uh, the agency's anti-harassment policy and procedures, use of ADR, as well as the agency's disability employment program. A word, uh, a word version of the Part G with a crosswalk of old questions, uh, you know, what the new questions correlate to old questions or if a question is completely new, can be found on the FedSEP guidance page. Um, and what I want to just show is 
you know, when you are clicking, so there, it's organized by the essential elements, and then when you go, each section of Part E has, uh, or Part G has Part A, B, um, they're organized numerically, and I am going to pick um, a new a section of Part uh, B1, Agency conducts reasonable assessments to monitor progress. So if I open this, um, it has a list of questions. And within each section of Part B, there, um, or Part B, sorry, and the sub questions, um, each question you have an option of yes, no, or NA. And underneath that, you have a text box that has 400 characters. And as you type, the text box will tell you how many characters are remaining. You can copy and paste in here. Um, I highly recommend reading the text questions carefully because in some cases, if you answer yes or no, you will be required to answer, uh, add text into the text box. If you answer an, in any text box, if you're answering NA, you have a uh, you have to put in information that explains why there's an NA in the text box. So, um, and if you have additional information that's positive, we inc recommend including it in the text box. So if I look at D1C, the question is, does the agency conduct exit interviews or surveys that include questions on how the agency could improve the recruitment, hiring, inclusion, retention, and advancement of individuals with disabilities? So my answer is no. And I put in the text, HR is exploring exit survey options. Um, and, you know, we recommend reviewing all of your answers for consistency because if in another section, it asks the agency utilize exit surveys and you say yes and then here you say no you would want to then explain why it doesn't address disability in your exit survey so then you hit save and you have to answer all questions in the section in order for the that section of part d to be completed and for the information to be saved um and at the top of the screen, there's tabs for going back to Part G. Um, so that's what I'm going to click. And this basically takes me through which sections of Part G have been completed. So in this case, I've completed all of the required sections of Part G. So now what I'm going to do is to go to part H, which is my Let me plan. just jump in oh. real quick, Anupa. Um, for part G, we've noticed that agencies sometimes miss the follow-up questions in part G. So if it says if yes and then asks you to provide information or if no, uh, if you do not put that information in, you should get an error message at the top of the screen. If you're saving from the bottom of the screen, you might miss the error message and think that the section's complete. So please make sure that you look to see if you get the blue bar that says it's saved or if you receive an error message. Lori, as long as we're, you're mentioning that about Part G, there is a comment um, just to let you know asking that the characters that in the comment sections be increased from 400 characters to 600 and Part J that be increased as well, just so that for consideration. We'll, we'll notify OIT about that request. So now um, I am in part H. Um, so you have in part H, um, if there is, it states, you know, please describe the status of each plan that the agency has implemented to correct deficiencies in the EEO program. Um, and then there is a checkbox if the agency did not address any deficiencies during the reporting period. Hope that that box is not checked. Um, now, what you'll see is that 
when um, I actually started populating some of these plans uh, for this webinar, but when you would initially um, get the screen, it would list out all of the numbers where there are uh, Part G subsections where there are deficiencies. So in this case, I identified deficiencies in B3A. The EEO office is not uh, involved in HR matters. Agency lacks sufficient staffing or resources to track career da uh, development data. And uh, RA requests are not processed and provided within a 30 day time frame. I left part uh, question D1C blank. Um, hopefully, we'll have time to at least go through part of it. So, what I want to do there is um, so D1C was the question about exit interviews asking about disability. So, here I'm going to say it asks a um, brief description of program deficiency. I'm going to say uh, it does not utilize exit surveys or ask about uh, uh, the exit surveys. So I'm just going to put that there. So no disability data is collected. And I hit save. So now I have a, and it shows you if you are making spelling errors and you can uh, right click and correct. Um, then the next section is to uh, objectives and dates for EEO plan. And that's actually where you're going to create your plan to address the deficiency. And this, the new portal actually takes you through step by step in creating your plan. Since this is a new uh, system, existing plans are not um, uploaded, so you will have to go back and enter that data if they're still applicable. Lori? Is there yes, anything you want, you want no, to add? I don't, I don't have anything. Okay, so, um, the, so once I click add for adding my plan. Um, it asks to the date initiated. So I'm going to say 7-1-2017. Um, explore, uh, create, and implement exit surveys for all employees. Focus on disability. And this is really not what, I mean, it should be more thorough and explained, but I'm for the sake of time. Um, so then I have a target date. Um, so that is the date that you are planning to meet the objective. Um, so I'm going to say uh, 9.30. 2018, um, but if it didn't happen during the last fiscal year, you have you can put in a modified date. So I'm going to put in as a modified date um, uh, 9-30-2019 and hit save. So now I have my objective. Then you would add a response. You would have the option. You have to add responsible officials. So this, the responsible officials are the officials who are who have authority over creating, uh, over implementing that objective. So in this case, I'm going to put the director of human resources. And their name, Sharon, and then the, it asks, is, these are required questions. It does the performance standards address the plan. 
So does Sharon's performance, uh, does the, for the HR director, is this in her performance standards? And that's being asked because that demonstrates the agency's commitment to addressing these deficiencies. In this case, I'm going to say yes and hit save. So now I have that responsible official. You can add additional responsible officials who are overseeing that objective. And so in this case, implementing exit survey might require um, your EEO director, maybe your DNI office, maybe um, someone within your director's office. You would want to add them as responsible officials. And then you have a section of planned activities towards completion of objectives. So for each planned activity, you have to press add. So one, I'm going to put one, uh, 7, 30, 20, 18, uh, review survey options. Now I ask as a required element, is there sufficient funding and staffing? I think for reviewing other surveys, there is. I'm gonna hit save. So I have one planned activity with a target date of 7-30-2018. We all know that just reviewing survey options is not going to get me towards achieving this objective. So what you would want to do is to continue adding activities. Each activity deserves its own section. Once you add the activity, then you can add accomplishments and modifications to the objective. So here I'm going to add, and that's pulled out by fiscal year. So I'm going to say in FY18, we had the accomplishment of um, reviewed multiple agency exit surveys. Obviously, you would want to add more details. So now I have accomplishments, which if you want to modify the whatever you wrote, you can, going forward, click the little um, pencil you want to delete it, you could click delete. If you're trying to delete, a pop-up comes onto your screen that says initiating delete process. Are you sure about deleting the selective? So I'm going to say no, and it's going to take me back to my home screen. So now I have a plan. It's incomplete, and you would want to keep adding to it. And once you have one in here, you can continue to update it over the next set of fiscal years. So now if I go through my part eight, I have four plans for the four deficiencies in my EEO program. If you have multiple deficiencies, um, you can delete. We do not recommend deleting them because it will show up as You've, you've identified a deficiency in your EEO program, but you do not have a plan to address them. So, Anupa, there's uh, uh, several questions on this, but I know it's a time, so I'm not sure what, um, what, how much more you need to finish in the, say, roughly eight minutes that we would have. Can um, we go with questions, or do you need to finish the uh, get I mean, all in which today? Lori, what would you like to do? I think we should probably keep moving. Um, many of the answer uh, questions are answered in section three of the revised MD 715 instructions. So moving forward, I want to show a part I, which is your plan to eliminate barriers. Um, so in this case, I'm going to just open up the plan I've already completed. So for everyone to note, part I is now only for um, Title VII EEO groups, your disability-related questions. 
um, and tables, your B table data is only in part J. So here, the first question you're going to be asked is, what's the trigger? So list the source of the trigger. So here it's workforce data. I've identified it as, so now here are my options. Since this is the new part I, you only have your A tables. I've identified A11, and I've put my summary as triggers exist for white and Asian females in the SES. All of those are required elements. You hit save, and it's saved. Next is EEO groups affected by a trigger. And in this case, you have a drop-down menu of the EEO groups. Once again, it's all men, all women, Hispanic or Latino males and females, white males and females, black or African American males or females, Asian males, Asian females, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander males or females, American Indian or Alaska Native males or females, two or more races, two or more, ra uh, two or more races males, two or more races females. Those are your only available EEO groups to select from. So you pick an EEO group and you would hit save and those groups populate. So here I've identified white females and Asian females. Then your next piece is to add the EEO sources affected by the trigger. So really what you're looking at is where did, how did you identify the trigger? Did you review sources? And what did you, uh, what information did you collect? So in this case, you might want to say you've, um, so I already entered one as the workforce data tables. And what I identified, maybe what I'm going to say is, um, Complaint data, sources reviewed. Um, yes, uh, more complaints filed, non-selection by white females. And I hit save. Now, and this is stuff that you can populate from previous part eyes if those are still plans you're working on. And now I have additional EEO sources if I've reviewed them or not and what information I've collected. Next is the status of my barrier analysis process. And you have to go through each section in order for a part I to be completed. So the questions asked are, was the barrier analysis process completed? And were any barriers identified? So I went ahead and answered yes. So now it'll show as yes. Next would be your statement of identified barriers. So I've created a barrier here, and that comes from clicking the button add. There it, say, it asks the question, what's the name? you know, identify the barrier and describe the source of that barrier. So the policy, procedure, or practice. So what I've identified is block pipeline for Asian females GS15 to SES. And I've described that the agency did not successfully recruit qualified Asian females for promotions to GS15 positions and did not select any Asian females for promotion. Now that is just the barrier that it, I've only identified it for Asian females in the GS15 to SES. The barrier for white females may be different. And so you would want to add that separately. And then once again, you have you would have to create objectives and data for EEO plans. And the reason we've broken it out in this way is because you could have a trigger that affects multiple EEO groups, um, and you may or may not have identified the barrier. But if you're, if you're looking at the barrier, the barriers may be different depending on the EEO group. And so that's why it walks you through this process. So you could have a trigger, and then that could result in various issues, or it could be the same barrier that's affecting multiple EEO groups. Um, Anupa, yeah. Anupa, 
I understand that we, we, we do have a little flexibility to go to 1.30 or so. Um, you can, I don't know if you want to take questions or just move on, but I just wanted to let, let you Let me know. just finish this section unless Lori wants to add something so far. No, I don't. Okay. So once um, I've identified, so I'm sticking with this one um, statement for now, and I'm going to add, go through and add the objective. So it asks, what's my objective? Date initiated, target date for completion, and is there sufficient funding and staffing to meet the objective? So in this case, I've stated that date initiated is 10-1-2018. Target date is 9-30-2021. Uh, and um, I, I guess the date's wrong because I got confused on the fiscal years. Um, and then I put my objective as increased recruitment of qualified Asian females for SES candidate development programs, because that's what I've identified as one of the areas where uh, that builds that pipeline. So I'm going to hit save. Oh, actually, I'm going to hit cancel because I've already created it. And then similar to part G, it asks about responsible officials. So I um, have gone through and added the two officials I think are um, are responsible for uh, the promotion issue, which is our director of human resources. And then I've also thought that the director of employee engagement, who may be doing my training at the agency, is the other responsible official. Then finally, you would list your planned activities towards completion of the objective. Um, so one of the activities that seems to that I've considered is to do a five year trend analysis of applicant flow data for GS 14 through SES to see if there are any areas um, that could that any issues that could cause a block pipeline. As you are going through your barrier analysis process, you would want to add more and more planned activities by target date, what those activities are, and whether or not there's sufficient staffing and funding for that activity. Do not put five different um, activities as one activity, because depending on what this is, a st it's requiring you to think through the process in a step-by-step -step format. So if you list that you're going to do an applicant flow study, and then you're going to conduct focus groups, and then you're going to create a candidate de development pipeline for Asian females. All of those are steps towards completing, uh, towards achieving the objective, but they're separate activities and may have separate target dates and funding and staffing requirements. And then here it asks for report of accomplishments. So I could say that if I had any accomplishments so far, I would be able to list them broken down by fiscal year. I'm going to cancel, and instead I am going back to part I. So now I have a completed part I for this one issue. With that, um, I'm going to pause for questions. Uh, there's a number that may go back, but let me ask a, a couple here that go to the uh, the idea of how, being able to have a report, a draft report, so that they complete the work and set behind the system, generate a draft report, so leadership can look at it, so it can be certified, because they need to be able to look at it before it'll be certified. So, we, in order to generate a draft report, you would have to complete all of your part forms, so parts A through J, and then go to review my plan. Here it will say what uh, parts of my plan are completed, and then if I click part reports, it will generate a PDF of my plan. It will also separately generate a PDF of your affirmative action plan. So you have to complete all parts in order to generate a full report, and you have to complete all of the parts and 
click review plan in order to be able to certify the report. Okay, uh, going back a little further, if you have more than one trigger for a particular study, can more than one be selected? Um, Lori? Yes, you can have as many Part I plans uh, that the agency has investigated. And uh, if there's more than one trigger that's related, perhaps to another trigger, it's possible you could combine them, but it's probably better if they're in separate plans. And then is a, um, is, if, is a comment related to a data source in part one required, even if you say no, you did not use that source? Um, no, you can't, I mean, so in the sources of uh, data, you can, um, so there's the data source, so you have to identify what that is, and you have to have a narrative description. Once you open, so per Lori, I'm actually going to delete this and say just there exists for Asian females. And um, now if, in this case, to create another plant based off another trigger, you would have that, um, a new list of sources of triggers. When you go to um, EOS, uh, the data sources, and you would pick the ones that you have um, reviewed. And then identify the information collected. Okay, so um, we have eight minutes left on 30, and um, I think there's a little left to cover, so uh, we better skip these questions. Uh, a couple of questions here for you to cover, Part J. Okay, and Part J is very similar to the uh, Part J that folks did uh, last year. Um, I think, okay. There we go. So um, now I've opened Part J. Um, what I want to just make sure folks understand is sections um, I through, I think the entire Part J is one document. And you uh, do have to, I would recommend, highly recommend just saving as you go through. Um, you have to answer all of the questions. Um, and what I will say is if in question, some of the questions have um, yes, no, or NA, um, if you select NA um, for the questions relating towards the progression of goals or um, any of the data questions, if you select NA, you have to explain why that data source is not available. So if you're selecting NA for applicant data, you have to put a brief summary about why, uh, what the, why the agency does not have applicant data and what your plan is to provide that data. Also note that there is a question in Part G about the agency's ability to collect applicant, collect and analyze applicant data. So if you're selecting NA and saying that the agency does not have applicant data, is working on collecting it, then your Part G should reflect that and you should have a Part H. So be mindful of how you are answering the questions to show consistency. Because if you answer yes in Part G that you have applicant data and you've analyzed it, but you're not able to provide that information for disability, then that shows as a discrepancy to us or you're not answering the questions correctly. Um, the one thing to note here is there is the new table um, on career development opportunities that require competition or supervised recommendation for approval to participate. And we have a list of various career development programs. And we ask the agency to report the number, the number of applicants and number of selectees, and then um, provide percentages based off of applicants and selectees for people with disabilities and people with targeted disabilities. Section three of the instructions explains what types of career development programs we are discussing. So 
um, and, you know, it, information about what is considered a, a career development program. Agencies should have access to this data because most of it would be reported on your SF-50. If you don't have any data or if you don't utilize that program, you need you must enter zero. Um, I'm going to just scroll down through all of the questions. Um, and in each section, there are 10,000 characters for your explanations. This is text only. Um, and moving down, um, so there are questions that ask about your internet address um, uh, for where certain procedures are posted, so you can enter that in. Um, and um, we received a number of questions about the EEO complaint um, and EEO complaint data and um, the percentages of the government-wide averages. That information about what the government-wide average for um, formal EEO complaints alleging harassment that were filed by people with disabilities um, and formal complaints alleging a failure to provide a reasonable accommodation, um, those that data is provided um, on the MD715 homepage as a notice. Um, I just also want folks to know that when we are asking for the follow-up questions in that section, um, the last fiscal year did any complaints alleging harassment based on disability status result in a finding of discrimination or a settlement agreement. We are asking about complaints at any stage of the EEO process. So this is not limited to um, complaints that have complaints and findings um, that have come up to OFO. This is at any stage of the process, so please respond accordingly. Um, finally, uh, so you, in order to, um, you, you once you have completed sections one through six, you want to hit. Save, um, and that will then allow you to go through section seven. So, and what you'll notice is that section seven is your is your plan to identify and remove barriers for people with disabilities and people with targeted disabilities. So, this is a new separate section for your disability program. And this is a this plan for identification and removal of barriers is required of all agencies, regardless of size. So, the first question asks if you've identified any barriers um, for people with disabilities or targeted disabilities. It's a yes, no. Next question is: Has the agency established a plan to correct barriers involving people with disabilities, people with targeted disabilities? Yes, no, NA. Based on that answer, you would then click Add Trigger. So that's a new box. And when you click that box, you get a pop-up that says you're navigating away from Part J. If you haven't saved the form, please hit Save. So make sure you hit Save. Excuse me, would you uh, recap which one of these, uh, what we're talking about? I got in here a little late on this conference. What are you talking about? Which part of the report? We're on Part J now, which part is your what? plan uh, for people with disabilities and targeted disabilities. And Anupa, I'm sorry, uh, we will need to wrap up here. We're in the last minute and a half. So this section is similar to the previous sections of adding a plan. Um, the thing that I want to just note is that once you've uh, completed adding all your plans to address barriers, you have to click the complete button um, for part J. That you have to click that button in order for part J as a whole to be completed um, in when you go to the review plan section. So with that, um, 
I think I'm done for now. Okay, and there's a number of questions that we uh, that couldn't get to a handful anyway. So um, just to throw this out for Lori and for you and Upa, how would uh, you like people to handle those questions that they may have not been able to get answered because of time? So um, you can feel free to um, reach out to me um, and either myself or Lori or one of the specialists will answer. If it is a general question about you know your report, please contact your EEO specialist um, as they will be able to answer these questions. Um, additionally, my contact information, if you don't already have it, is A-N-U as an umbrella, P as in Paul, A as an apple, dot I as an ice cream, Y as in yellow, E as an elephant, R as in rabbit, at EEOC.gov. And my phone number is 202-663-4837. So feel free to reach out to me, but first contact your specialist. Um, and then this will be recorded as well. So for folks who joined late, you can uh, view this. Okay, thank you, Lori and Anupa. And um, at least I think this is a really uh, great start at answering all the questions that people have. We thank you, we thank our audience, and please remember, uh, the Excel conference at the end of July, and we'll uh, look to see you later. Thank you.